Hey there, pre-med. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of the endocrine system with the parathyroid gland, the kidney, and how they relate to maintain homeostatic balance in the body. If you didn't get a chance to watch my endocrine video on the major organ systems and their pathways, you can check it out here. Let's get started by talking about the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid gland are actually four small pea-sized glands on the back of your thyroid gland, kind of in your neck area. And these guys are really important for producing the parathyroid hormone, or PTH, as we'll call it for the rest of this video. PTH is our major hormone regulating calcium homeostasis. So the calcium ion, CA2+, uh, gets regulated by seeing how much is in our bloodstream. And if we have too much in our bloodstream, too much calcium, then we put it into our bones. And if we have too little calcium, we'll go ahead and break down our bones to release more calcium into our bloodstream. But why is calcium so important? Think about where you've seen calcium ions in other organ systems in the body. If you're thinking neuromuscular junction, something about neurons and muscle contraction, you're absolutely correct. Calcium is one of our major ions involved in muscle contraction and response to neural stimulus in the neuromuscular junction. So we need to have a certain amount of calcium in our bodies, and it needs to be just the right amount to make sure that our muscles and neurons are functioning properly. As we go through the pathway for PTH and our calcium balance, I want you to notice the feedback regulation and kind of reciprocal effect that helps us balance calcium homeostasis. This is really relevant in all endocrine and homeostatic pathways in our body, where of course we're always trying to maintain a balance, right? So as certain things go up, other things will be downregulated and vice versa. So it's a very reciprocal effect and the parathyroid hormone is one of the best examples I use to talk about feedback regulation and maintaining homeostasis. Now, as we go through these pathways, as a reminder, I'm gonna be teaching this to the level of the MCAT, which requires an undergraduate biology level. You don't need to know advanced endocrinology and A&P to do well in the MCAT, so I'm going to be keeping this pretty big picture. There's a lot of really cool nuance to the endocrine system and to the parathyroid hormone that if you wanna go deeper, you absolutely should, but for this video, we're gonna keep it big picture and focus on the basics. Let's dive in. All right, so we talked about how the parathyroid gland produces parathyroid hormone, and that's involved in calcium homeostasis, and we're gonna bring in the other players shortly. Our normal calcium levels in our blood should be between 8.5 and 10.2 milligrams per deciliter, so I'm just gonna use the number nine milligrams per deciliter here. Uh, you don't need to know this for test day, it's just nice, I think, sometimes to have a number so we can say when it's going up, hypercalcemia, it's gonna be greater than 10, and when it's low, hypocalcemia, it's less than eight, right? So that's just kind of our range so that we can talk about these numerically as we're talking about the response of our endocrine system to these changing levels. So parathyroid hormone is what is produced by these, see these little parathyroid glands here? That's where they are. So the hormone that's being produced there is parathyroid hormone, PTH. Now PTH is produced, we'll go ahead and write it in green, when we have low calcium levels, um, when calcium levels drop, and I'll go ahead and put it in concentration, calcium levels are low. So like, let's say below eight milligrams per deciliter, just to again, have a number here. So our body recognizes, um, we're like, whoa, we're checking our blood and we have too low blood calcium, our parathyroid glands are like, okay, time to release our PTH. PTH is a peptide hormone, all right, so it's gonna to bind to receptors and have second messenger signals. Um, and so it's going to have a couple different actions, but our goal, right? The goal for PTH is to increase calcium levels. That's just a nice thing to think about, right? It's like, all right, this is what we're trying to do. And it does this in a couple different ways. The first way is it goes to the bones, all right? So the bones are where we store calcium. You probably know this, right? Calcium is involved in our bone matrix and it's kind of like our storage, right? Our, our vaults, our bank for extra calcium. So sure, it's necessary for building bones, but actually one of our primary reasons for keeping calcium in our bones, in our skeletal system, is to store it in case we need more calcium in our blood. Because oftentimes by the time we need that calcium in our blood, we can't like consume more calcium it's too late for us, right? Muscles and neurons move very quickly in terms of their needs. So we need to have an internal storage of calcium and that's our bones. So what PTH will do is it'll interact with our bones. Specifically, we have two types of cells in our bones, osteoblasts, build bones, right? Build bone and osteoclasts, 
break down bone. So if our storage is in our bones, what do you think we need to do? We probably need to break down the bones, right? So the end result of PTH, increased PTH is increased osteoclast activity. All right, we're gonna be breaking down bones and that's going to cause a release of calcium two plus into the bloodstream. Now, uh, for reference, again, this is a little out of scope of the MCAT, but it does this actually indirectly by inhibiting osteoblasts. It doesn't directly stimulate osteoclasts, it actually just inhibits the osteoblast, which has a reciprocal effect to uh, upregulate the breakdown of bone. Uh, but again, osteoclast breaking down bone, we're doing that to release the calcium, not because we want to break down our bones, but because we need to release calcium in our bodies. All right, so that's great. And if that's all we need to do, awesome. And then, of course, once calcium levels come back up, that's going to downregulate our PTH and kind of turn off this endocrine signal. The other way that PTH increases calcium in the blood is by going to the kidney. The kidney, you say? Why would we do that? Well, the kidney is responsible for getting rid of excess ions, um, excreting out things we don't need. And calcium is one of those ions right? It's not usually when we think of when we think of the kidney, but it's absolutely something that the kidney can regulate in terms of keeping things in our body versus excreting them out. So what PTH will do is it'll ask the kidney, they'll say, hey, please reabsorb any calcium ions that come through. Increase reabsorption of calcium. Reabsorption is bringing it back into the body, out of the nephron, right? Out of the filtrate. So it allows uh, the kidney to help reabsorb the calcium so that we excrete less of it, right? So you could also think about it as decreased excretion of calcium 2 plus. Both of those synonymous with what's happening. There. In addition to directly reabsorbing calcium, the kidney also does something funky, which is that it can activate vitamin D from its inactive form. So the inactive form of vitamin D is vitamin D3, and the active form is called calcitriol. And PTH signaling, when the PTH signal comes down into the kidney and binds to the receptors, that's going to cause the activation of the active form of vitamin D, which is known as calcitriol. Citriol. Now, why does that matter? Because, here I'll go ahead and highlight it in a different color so we can move it over. Calcitriol, or again, activated vitamin D, helps us absorb calcium in the small intestine when we eat it in food. It's pretty cool, right? So, PTH kind of does this immediate action where it says, hey bones, release calcium into the bloodstream, but also, hey kidney, do not excrete the calcium. Make sure that we keep that in our bodies and also can you produce some activated vitamin D. So as we consume calcium, it helps us absorb that calcium from our food into our bloodstream from the small intestine. So again, you probably have heard, right, colloquially when you're talking about vitamins and minerals and what we should take to uh, help our bodies, that vitamin D and calcium need to kind of go together, right? You can't just take a calcium supplement. You also need enough vitamin D to help you absorb that calcium, helps build strong bones. Why? Because we have plenty of calcium in the bloodstream, and then we can signal our bones to actually build instead of having to be broken down to produce more blood calcium. Pretty cool, right? A lot of our basic personal health makes a lot more sense once we've studied the endocrine system. We've now talked about what happens when our blood calcium levels are too low. Before we get into what happens when our blood calcium levels are too high, I'm Amanda Brem and I've been coaching students on their pre-med journeys since 2019. Please remember to subscribe to this channel for more videos on MCAT content, test taking strategy, and mental fitness tips to help you perform your best on testing. And if you'd like more lessons on topics like this, including personal interaction, study planning, and individualized support throughout your MCAT journey, please go ahead and check out our next available course in the caption below. All right, so what happens in our body if our blood calcium levels get too high, like greater than 10 milligrams per deciliter, so like 15 or 20? Well, our body reads that and says, whoa, calcium levels are too high. We got to drop those down because it's very important to maintain just the right level of calcium in our bodies. The way we do this is we actually use our thyroid gland and our thyroid gland releases a hormone called calcitonin. Calcitonin is our reciprocal hormone to PTH. So PTH does all of these things to increase blood calcium in the blood. Calcitonin will have the opposite action to decrease. So calcitonin is released when CA2 plus levels are too high, right? And our goal is to decrease blood calcium levels. 
right? It's always nice to kind of keep that organized in your notes. It's responding to one thing, so its goal is to do the opposite, right? That's oftentimes where things get a little confusing with feedback mechanisms. It's like, okay, what's the instigator and then what is the goal, right? And keeping that straight in your notes can be very helpful. So how does it do this? Pretty much opposite to PTH, all right? It's going to start off by going into the bones. Instead of stimulating osteoclast activity, we wanna increase osteoblast activity, resulting in more bone deposition and more calcium being stored in the bones and being taken out of the blood. The way it does this, kind of similar to PTH, remember how I said that PTH uh, indirectly stimulates osteoactivity by inhibiting osteoblast activity? Calcitonin kind of does the same thing. It inhibits osteoclast activity. So it's kind of this indirect method that both of these hormones are doing by kind of inhibiting the other type of cell to allow for its opposite to do more work, all right? But the net result is that we're having more bone deposition, osteoblast activity. Calcitonin is also going to act on the kidney. And again, it's going to kind of do the opposite. So it's going to say, hey, please allow us to get rid of a bunch of calcium, please. So it's going to decrease reabsorption of calcium and it's going to increase calcium excretion. Calcitonin also decreases calcium absorption in the small intestine. So we'll have less calcium absorption from our foods in the small intestine. So our net result of calcitonin production, calcitonin release into the bloodstream, is to decrease serum calcium levels, whereas the net result of PTH release by the parathyroid gland is to increase serum calcium levels. So they have opposite effects, which means as PTH is circulating, it's inhibiting calcitonin release. And as calcitonin is circulating, it's inhibiting PTH release. These are reciprocal hormones, so one level is going to be opposite the other. Now, as always, it's nice to think about the clinical applications of this pathway. One of the major chronic issues in aging patients is osteoporosis, or a breakdown of bone. So you can imagine the types of therapeutic techniques in terms of regulating this system that we could do to control for the breakdown of bone. We might want to give them more calcitonin, right? Calcitonin and excess calcium and vitamin D to provide tons of calcium available to stimulate those osteoblasts to build up more bone. So in fact, that is one of our treatments is to utilize hormone supplements to help us build bones and to inhibit the action of PTH. So if you have an osteoporotic patient, you want to decrease their PTH levels and increase their calcitonin levels. That's just one of many clinical applications that you could see for this endocrine system. And the key to understanding those clinical applications is to have the basic rules of the pathway down path. I hope this video was helpful for you. If it was, please feel free to share it with your pre-med community so we can all help each other reach our pre-med and MCAT goals. Thanks for watching and as always, happy studying.